Well, we're going to have an abbreviated service today. And we're going to have an abbreviated service, but let me make it explicitly clear. An abbreviated service by no way means uh, talks about the importance of what we're going to be doing. As a matter of fact, what I wanted to do today is in keeping with what we have been talking about uh, since uh, we've moved here, and that is that we want to be a congregation that worship God not only with our hearts, but also with our minds. And so what I wanted to do is spend a few minutes to talk about something that we do so often. Oftentimes, we do it over and over and over again that we even lose the significance or even the impact that it can have on my life. And even perhaps that I do things so in such a frequent manner that sometimes I do it and did not even realize that I did it. Have you ever done something like that? I mean, I, that I would drive a particular place and if someone would ask me, well, did you turn on such and such a street? I'm not sure if I did, but my habit tells me that I would have turned on that street. But I can't distinctly remember that I turned on that particular street. Well, I've been a Christian for almost 33 years. Do the math. I have attended Sunday services 52 times 33. That is about 1,560 plus another 103 times 156. It's a lot. 1,700, over 1,700 services that I have attended. Let's say for whatever reason, vacation, sickness, 10% of those, let's say even more than that, I did not attend for, for, for some particular reason. A conservative math will tell me that I have had and participated in about 1,500 communion services. Here's the sad part. There are but a few of them I can remember. Here's the sadder part. It's the ones that I talked about. <laughs> it is something that we do with such frequency, I'm afraid that maybe we don't even understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and oftentimes maybe our mind goes wandering. My prayer is a very significant one after this, that we will never take communion the same way again. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That's a pretty bold statement. Well, if it applies to you, awesome. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, as is our practice here in the church on most Sundays, the thing that we're going to talk about, you get a note in your newsletter, hey, go ahead and read these scriptures so that you come in a little bit prepared for our services on Sunday. And so I gave you, and if you didn't read it, you're going to be a little bit behind. I talked to, uh, I was with Alex this week. He said his wife was taking out the scriptures and he was reading it, and, and he said, man, and he asked, why are you reading that? And he, she said, well, Tony asked us to read this. I didn't know what that implied about what Alex does with my, with my, mess, uh, with my notes, but that's a different discussion for a different time. We're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. It says this, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Given the fact that this is the most educated city 
in, the, uh, in Canada, these are sensible people. And so Paul appeals maybe to their pride a little bit. And so he says, I, I know who I'm talking to are people who can make sense of this, okay? These are not crazy people. He says, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks our participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the, bud, uh, the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed on altar is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participant with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul writes, and if you were to read the book of Corinthians, there were some serious issues in that congregation. Not the least of which, as a matter of fact, the underlying thing with what was going on in this congregation is the idea of divisions showing itself in many different ways. And Paul writes and he talks about the idea of the Lord's Supper, also called the Lord's Table, Communion, Eucharist, the Holy Communion, uh, the Cup of Blessings, the Breaking of Bread, many, many terms that talks about the same event. One of the things that we notice that Paul writes in addressing this congregation, he says the first thing that we got to see in regard to the communion is that unity is symbolized in a great way. As a matter of fact, he says, and he paints the picture, that when people participate in the bread, it is actually from one loaf signifying one body. And the idea here is that whatever we have done throughout the day, throughout the week, we come together as one body participating in this communion service, even the word communion, I wonder if we even know what the word means. The idea is that we're all together being unionized in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he's going to address this issue. He, he, he lays the foundation that we are one As a matter of fact, he says that when we partake in this cup of thanksgiving, we're participating in the blood of Christ and we are participating in the body of Christ. And so the idea here is that this is not something that we have because we do it every Sunday. I'll talk a few moments about how frequently the Bible says we ought to do it. Or what it doesn't say. But the idea that coming together, as a matter of fact, I actually at one time misunderstood the Lord's Supper. And I thought that the idea was about remembering only the death burial and resurrection of our Lord. And of course, that's immensely important. We'll talk about that in a second. And I did not see the idea of the family coming together in celebrating this. 
And as a matter of fact, there are times that, and I don't think it's inherently sinful, but it's not the intent of the Lord's Supper. Uh, there are times with people who did not come to the church service, I would at times go and participate in communion with them. And there are people who, who are shut-ins. That's a different story altogether. But the idea is that we are all coming together and having our individual times to go to have the Lord's Supper is not the intention of what is being talked about here. Is that we come together and actually participate in the body and blood of Christ. And so he paints the idea and he gives us the idea that what we're talking about here is there is a great unity. But that's just the beginning. And he says, by the way, um, it's really important when we take it, when we go to the altar, and, and he uses some, uh, uh, some thinking here about how, what attitude they should have in regard to food sacrifice to idols. I don't have time to talk about that here, but I want to continue, okay? And so if you understand the book of uh, Corinthians, is a response that Paul had to a lot of questions they asked him, what about certain things in the church? Okay, and he addresses those things on a number of occasions. And so here he specifically, we turn to chapter 11 now, in verse 17, he's talking about specifically the Lord's Supper. So he introduced it and he says, listen, the idea here is that there's a tremendous focus on us doing it together participation in the body and the blood of Christ. And there is unity that is a very, very big factor. And the imagery that is paced, that, that is uh, uh, posed for us, is quite significant. Then we pick it up in verse 17. It says this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. Ow. If you were to read the other issues that Paul addressed, he gave them some benefit and then he corrected them. This one, he went straight to the fact and he said, I have no praise for you. And I'll tell you why. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. If there is anything in all Scripture, in all the world, that makes us equal, it is the cross of Jesus Christ. It says there at the foot of the cross, you are all destined to hell. And yet, through the blood of Christ, we can all be reconciled to Christ. And there's no one of you, not even one, that is better off than another. And for that reason, you have no boast. No doubt there have to be differences among you, in verse 19, to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, there's that phrase, coming, everybody coming together. It is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise? This is a statement I had to read seven, eight times for me to understand and to see the seriousness. Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? The Bible says that we can humiliate God's church if what we're doing somehow shows that those who don't have are less than those who have. Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say then to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. What was happening here in the church is that, as you can imagine, that in uh, the, uh, 
that the Israelites were under the Roman rule. And of course, a lot of the Christians who became uh, servants of the Lord actually were slaves. Some of them were servants. And so their freedom and their ability to worship was hampered significantly by the fact that they were not free. And so what happened was that they would come together and of course those who were rich uh, did not have to subject themselves to any uh, 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 master. And so people would be able to come to church or their meeting together at different times, bringing different kinds of food. And so when someone brings you like a real nice sirloin or whatever like steak you like, or grass-fed Kobe beef, like $100 a pound, whatever it is, then you realize that person got some money. You bring someone who brings a couple of crackers and maybe cheese, maybe cheese that has no mold on it, and you realize, man, you, this person doesn't have as much. And what these meetings were doing is that they were, it was so set up that they were actually, by the fact of the way they were having it, it promoted some people who had and some people who did not have. And Paul perhaps one of the sharpest rebukes in the scriptures. We're a family. Melanie and I have gotten together with a number of disciples in the church. There were a number of you who communicated to us that coming to service hurt their faith more than it helped. As a matter of fact, some people would come here because they were a simple obligation and then go back home in some way, shape, or form, gather in a group so that their faith could be built up. You have to ask yourself, and I have to ask myself, what role did I play in that? Paul writes and he says, our meetings did more harm than good. And so we have to ask ourselves, what did we do? If, if this idea of this incredible event together where we participate in the body and blood of Christ, if we did not do it and we were not unified and we were not communing, but instead we were going through a ritual, Paul addresses this issue. Verse 29, 23. For what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, for which, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. One of the things that's really important about, we understand about the Lord's Supper, it is a time of remembrance. It's a time of remembering what Jesus did for you and what he did for I. It is stunning and shocking, yet it was the state of affairs, that Jesus had to institute a rite in which we would actually have to be, have to remind ourselves what Christ did for us. I mean, think about that for a second. And yet, embarrassingly, I need to be reminded. Now, how often 
varies among Christendom. Some people do it every week. We do it because Acts 20 says we got together the first day of the week and we broke bread. Some, uh, some places do it once a week. Some places once every three months. Some places every day. The Bible never really gives us a specific instruction as to how frequently we ought to do it. We followed an example, and I don't think it's a bad thing at all. But the idea is that there is a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. You know, one of the things that we do as a congregation, and I'm not sure how well we do it, is that we usually have somebody come up here for the time of the communion service is to help us. And if when we're sharing doesn't ultimately help us remember Christ, then we're not doing what we ought to be doing. If somehow when we share, it points towards me, or if you are thinking about the person up here, then we would have failed in our task. Whatever we're doing has got to ultimately point to Jesus Christ. And so if we share about our lives, cool, but point it on what Christ has done for me. That it points and gives the glory and honor to Jesus Christ. I remember I was part of a congregation and people came up here and they started really being open with their lives. To the point where people were like it was a race. The next person that got up, they wanted to be more open than the person before them. And they're sharing really crazy stuff. Bordering on pornography. In an effort to be open. Never turning it back to this is what Christ has rescued me from. Or, and so if you were asked sometime to do the communion, that's what we're asking. Is that we go back and we ultimately turn it to Jesus Christ. And if we make it about us, we have lost it all. Another aspect besides the unity and besides the remembrance of Jesus is that there's a proclamation. There's a proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. That we talk about the good news. You know, when the Israelites came together and they remembered the Passover, they will at the end, because they will do this as a yearly thing, they will at the end of every Passover, they'll raise their cups and they say, till next year. Till next year. Till next year. When we take the Lord's Supper, you know what we're saying? Until he comes again. Until he comes again. Until he comes again. Until he comes again. It's not something that we've got to do and stuff something in our mouth. And if it's not done, and we'll talk about this in a second as we close out. That when we take this, that it is not something that we simply do. He died so that we can live. That there is something more than just some ritual. Another thing that he talks about is that this is a temporary thing, right? Until he comes again. This is one of the sacraments. He said, as I read the scripture, it's not saying in heaven we're going to have the communion. This is for this point and time in our life. That we proclaim the gospel, that we talk ultimately what Christ has done on our behalf. And lastly, and there are many other things, but lastly what I want to cover, and this is a time of renewal of our, of our covenant with Christ. It's an opportunity for self-examination. Where we commit ourselves to Christ, 
in our approach. This is what he says, verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the of the Lord in an unworthy manner may be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we're judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, whenever you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further directions. There's an idea here that Paul writes, and he says, this, there is a sense of self-examination. And he says, we can't do it in an unworthy manner. Let me say what that is not. We can't be, per it's not talking about our perfection and how spiritual we are, okay? Because none of us is worthy. It's why Christ died. It's because we are not worthy. And so we respond because of our unworthiness. And God, through his grace and his mercy, says, come into my kingdom. And so that's not what he's talking about. But it's not a cavalier. It's not a flippant. It's not texting while you're taking the Lord's Supper. It's not thinking about what you're eating for lunch. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us that if we do it without discernment and thinking about what we're doing, we're bringing judgment on ourselves. And it says one of the scariest scriptures in the Bible that it's why some of you are sick and weak. And fallen asleep, died. I don't know why Ananias and Sapphira literally died when they lied. Because I can tell you, you and I have lied. And we are not dead. I don't know that. But Paul's writing saying, listen, this is not some joke. This is not something to be taken lightly. This is something that ought to be with such great self-examination and such great thought. To discern the body of Christ, to recognize that the body of Christ, that to realize we could fall into judgment if we do not do this. So, I pray when now we take the Lord's Supper, we're acknowledging what we cannot do for ourselves. Amen. We're acknowledging, and the idea of a sacrament is an idea through this sacrament, God's divine grace is bestowed upon us. In our nomenclature, baptism would be one of those. Where God's divine grace, because of this act that we have done, is now bestowed upon us. The communion is similar in the sense of what it does in the participation in the body and blood of Christ. That there is something supernatural. Oh, we're not talking about transubstantiation, where this becomes the body and blood of Christ. But there's something supernatural about taking it as one body, not divisive. But with one body, we are claiming who we are in Christ. And so, as we take the Lord's Supper, let's think about the unity that this brings. Let's remember what Christ has done for us. Let us remember where it is also a proclamation of who and what Christ has done on our behalf. And this is a time that we renew our covenant with our God. And we say, God, I am sorry if I've not done what I needed to do. 
It's not about beating yourself up. It's about a sense of self-examination. That's what the word says. Can you imagine if we do this every week and we really take it seriously? What the next week is going to be like? Let us go ahead and give thanks for the body and blood of Christ in a renewed way. God, we're just thankful that your son offered himself on that altar for us and that we not in a cavalier fanner, manner acknowledge what your son has done on our behalf. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you for the body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.